Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to CIEPS, Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies. CIEPS provides research-based publications, analysis, and podcasts on uh, most things related to European policies and EU affairs. CIEPS is a, an autonomous research agency that um, that aims to be a bridge between policymakers and academia. My name is Jakob Levander, and I'm a researcher in political science here at the Institute, and I will be the moderator of today's seminar, which is about Euro parties, European political parties, and their impact and their role in shaping the agenda and the conversation, basically, in the conference on the future of the European Union. Here to present the freshly uh, freshly published publication on this issue, we have with us Carl Magnus Johansson, who is an affiliate uh, professor in political science at Södertörn University. And we also have Tapio Raunio, who is a professor in uh, political science at uh, Tampere University. A very warm welcome. And also, to discuss these findings and have uh, to reflect a bit on uh, the main uh, arguments of the uh, publications. We also have with us Jessica Rusval, who is a member of the Swedish parliament and uh, also vice chair of the EU affairs committee. And also last but not least, she is also a member of the CIEPS advisory board. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to have a presentation from uh, the authors of the report, after which we will have uh, some comments from Jessica on the, on the main findings. And after this, we will have a bigger and broader uh, discussion and reflection about the findings. But without further ado, I will leave the floor to Tapio for his part of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jakob. I will now share the screen. So, uh, you are welcome also from me and Karl Magnus. And I would like first to thank CIEPS for uh, all the encouragement all along the way and for giving us the opportunity to do the research for this report. It's been, it's been uh, very exciting to do this uh, because uh, Karl Magnus and I have been working on, on Euro parties and, and the European Parliament uh, since the mid-1990s. And uh, so, you know, we have a long track record of, of uh, examining these European level partisan actors. And I suppose, you know, what makes this also a kind of a frustrating field of, of inquiry is the simple fact that when you look at media, the European Union, at least in Finland, and I suppose the same applies to Sweden, that it's it's still very much about member states all the time. You know, whether it's France, Germany, uh, Sweden, whatever country we are talking about, and at the same time, these ideologies, political parties, somehow stay in the background. And and so so and 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 I suppose part of the rationale or motivation behind our report is to sort of you know, bring, bring more light on, on how these, how these uh, European level partisan actors influence these, these important processes taking place at the European level. Now, when we talk about political parties at the European level, that is the so-called Euro parties, they are ever present. I mean, they're all over the place, but measuring their exact uh, importance, exact influence is, is very, very difficult. And but it's important from the beginning to remember that when we talk about most influential European politicians, uh, you know, people like Macron or, or the German chancellors like Merkel and now Scholz, even commission president von der Leyen, these are all at the same time active in the Euro party circles. So, you know, even in, in our report, you will find mentions about how these important individuals were present in these Euro party meetings. So someone like, like Merkel, I mean, she was not just leading the German government for a long time, 
she was also highly important within the European People's Party, the, the largest of the, of the Euro parties. And this, this alone makes it, you know, from the outset, very difficult to, to sort of measure the extent to which a, an individual politician influences things, you know, as a head of a government or as a, as a sort of a party politician. Secondly, these Euro parties have extensive networks, and these are networks that they have developed over decades. And so we not only do, do they have these official member parties, uh, but they also have political foundations, which you could call like think tanks that are affiliated with the Euro parties. Then there's a variety of interest groups that are interact closely with the Euro parties. And then uh, you also have activists, that is people on the ground, sort of a grassroots level. But as also our report kind of indicates, it is this on the ground dimension, which is, which is quite weakly developed. And, and Karl Magnus and I believe that there's a lot of potential there in that how Euro parties could reach, reach the citizens better in the future. And then these Euro parties, and of course also their party groups in the European Parliament, they have decades of experience from, from intergovernmental conferences, you know, where the treaties of the European Union, Union are amended. And uh, so they are, you know, they're sort of a seasoned veterans of, of these processes. And they also have this ongoing tradition of debating somehow the future of Europe. So it may not be specifically about the conference on the future of Europe, but it is more broadly the idea of, of what Europe and what the European Union will look like in the future. And certainly when you go through the agenda items of the Congresses, that is the main, main decision-making bodies of the Euro parties, in basically every single Congress, you find some kind of a debate about the future of Europe. Now then turning more specifically to the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, I mean, it must have been very frustrating for, for the people who are organizing this event, because first of, all, first of all, it is a unique thing. I mean, it is the first time that something, uh, something on this scale has been uh, organized. That is a multi multilingual digital platform inviting citizens to Brussels, you know, average citizens to Brussels for these citizens panels, etc., and uh, then, of course, first came COVID, which delayed the conference by a whole year. And now, of course, we have the tragic events unfolding in Ukraine with Russia invading or trying to invade the country. And, and so, you know, like, for example, now the conference on the future of Europe is at its final stages, yet you see hardly any media coverage at all. And... Um, and this is a big shame. But I, I mean, I can't, I mean, under normal conditions, I would blame the media. But I mean, of course, now it is quite understandable that the eyes are on, on, on what is going on in Ukraine. Then, of course, when we think about this conference, you know, it, it is a very good question whether this is a kind of a top-down symbolic exercise or whether it's, it is a genuine attempt at listening to Europeans. And I suppose, and this is something we also discuss in the report, that it is somewhere in between. Now, on the last slide uh, was the name of Macron, and Macron was actually highly, highly uh, important in initiating this conference. He, he had uh, carried out similar uh, citizen consultations in France, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I do believe that there are these politicians, high-level politicians who, who genuinely believe that this is important. But of course, then when we think about the distance between so-called Brussels and the and normal Europeans, you know, it, it is difficult. It is difficult to reach out to people. But I, I would recommend that anybody who is who is cynical about this would go would go to these this multilingual digital platform and uh, you know which operates on in, in all EU official languages, including, of course, Swedish and Finnish, and 
And it is encouraging to see that how many people are actually taking part in these debates. So, so you know, at least at least a fair number of Europeans, you know, hundreds of thousands have been activated. And uh, so, so that is a positive sign. Now, COVID delayed the conference by roughly a year, but, uh, and it was frustrating, but the, the planning for the conference really began about three years ago. And in our report, we go through in quite a lot of detail uh, the, the process that led up to the conference. And you can clearly see how the European Parliament and the EP groups were very active in the agenda setting phase. And, and together with the commission, which normally is on the, on the parliament side in, in a lot of things, and you also see there the Euro party links, you know, that uh, the commission and the party groups sort of, uh, or the commissioners and the party groups acting together. You can see that the, these parties and actors were influential in, in shaping the format on, of the conference and also its agenda. So you, you can, you can sort of uh, clearly see that. And by the way, one thing that we did not analyze in this report, but something that is for future research, it would be interesting to find out the extent to which these Euro parties and, and for example, their activists, how much they contributed to the debates that you find, that you find on this multilingual uh, digital platform. I mean, I, I think it's a it's a reasonable guess that that uh, you know there's been quite a lot of sort of a partisan activity going on in on that platform. Now, and and what is also kind of frustrating, I suppose, for a lot of people is that the conference on the future of Europe uh, engages with citizens, but it's this uncertainty about the outcome. I mean, most member states kind of seem to be ruling out treaty change. You know, as a sort of an, how would I say, almost like a semi-automatic reaction that no, no treaty change is to be is to be implemented. And but it's not that easy. And I will come to this at the end of my uh, presentation uh, because there are some powerful actors in Europe currently that are that are uh, you know in favor of in favor of uh, revisiting the treaties. So. Let's see what happens. But I think the current guess would be that the conference will end in a, some sort of a high profile, uh, you know, high profile event where, where the main results will be, will be then uh, announced. But uh, of course, directly, there will be no, no impact on the treaties. Now, firstly, in the report, then going to the Going to the uh, uh, sort of empirical part of our report, the European Parliament is very experienced at dealing with, with the Commission and the Council. And normally what the European Parliament does in these interinstitutional bargaining rounds is that you see the centrist groups, and these are the groups that we analyze in, in our report, the European People's Party, the Party of the European Socialists and its party group, the the Socialists and Democrats, and then the Liberal Party and its, its party group, uh, Renew Europe. So these centrist groups have a long established tradition of building coalitions and trying to present a sort of a united front front vis-a-vis -vis the Commission and particularly the Council. And we saw this again with this conference. So the final EP resolution on the Conference of the Future of Europe was adopted with a broad majority in the parliament. And when we look at the debates, and when we look at who were active in these sort of uh, uh, discussions, we see throughout the process, the leading figures of the main party groups, you know, the chairs of the party groups or other people like Verhofstadt, you know, people that are known as, as having a special interest in these in the so-called future of Europe. Then when we go to the division of labor, what we find there is that Euro parties, you know, that is the actual Euro parties, uh, those that are extra parliamentary, they had a, I would say a very limited role. 
uh, at least in comparison with the with the uh, EP groups. And uh, I will not say much about this because Carl Magnus will will uh, will say a few words about this after after my presentation. But it's clear that the EP groups were more present, and then the Euro Party is very much in the background. But nonetheless, both were active. And also, in fact, where the Euro parties came, uh, where, there, where they were more visible, was that they organized all kinds of events, you know, utilizing these networks that they had. And uh, in the report, we give a quite a detailed account of, of how, how these of these events and how, how we had Merkel there, how we had other leading politicians taking part, how we saw individual commissioners present. So, so it, it is a sort of an ongoing, ongoing process all the time. Uh, you have several of these every year. And sadly, and I find this very sad, the national medias basically never cover any of this, not even the Euro Party Congresses. And I find that, that very frustrating. Then we also uh, analyze the positions of the Euro parties and their EP groups, because all of these, or, or each, the three party families that we analyze, they all published these quite detailed position papers. Now, our findings will not come as a surprise to those of you who are familiar with the Euro parties. So what you find there, and this is in interesting, first of all, they are in favor of of opening the treaties, so in favor of treaty change. Secondly, they are in favor of new institutions. So meaning that, for example, in, in foreign and security policy, there should be more streamlined decision-making. In economic and monetary union, again, some kind of new positions should be, should be established. Now, I'm not sure if that is wise, but I mean, they, 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 ha they have this kind of an agenda that, that, is, that also reaches back to, to the days before the conference. And then of course, not surprisingly again, deeper policy integration. In response to COVID, there's now much talk about the health union. And then of course, now with the events unfolding in Ukraine, there is heightened awareness, awareness of, of the need for a European energy union. But of course, the problem here is, and this is why I'm saying that one should not underestimate the pressure for treaty change. Because for example, if the European Union wants to do more in terms of health, it would perhaps mean that the treaties would need to be amended. And, and uh, so, so I think there is, there is quite a lot of, lot of pressure for, for treaty change. Note that Germany, German, the new government, is openly talking about the need to revise the treaties. And then uh, Macron will undoubtedly win the elections, presidential elections in France. And do note that Macron is a very committed uh, sort of a Europeanist. And I would, I would, my guess is that during his second, second uh, five year period in office, I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that he's, He's uh, aiming at leaving some kind of a some kind of a footprint on on EU's institutional or constitutional architecture. So I think there's quite a lot of pressure. And and then of course you know these tragic events in Ukraine. Then of course climate change, COVID. All of these are now you know there's there's this kind of a realization. Of course, not everybody agrees with it, but I mean there's there's a kind of an stronger realization of the fact that if we want to tackle these transnational, whatever you want to call them, cross-national challenges, then you need somehow a stronger European Union. And some of this you can achieve without amending the treaties, but a lot of it would require treaty change. And as we know, treaty change requires consensus among the member states, which is, which is a uh, very, very difficult to achieve. But before giving the floor to Karl Magnus, I would just like to say that the positions of these Euro parties deserve attention and they, they should be taken seriously. I mean, they're, they're not just these 
random documents produced by some Europhile, you know, politicians. You know, these are documents where Swedish political parties have been involved in, you know, Swedish social democrats, Swedish moderates, you know, these parties have been involved in, they have agreed to these documents. And, and, and hence that is, that is also very you know, important to remember. So it's not just about Brussels doing something. It is about national politicians getting together at the European level, agreeing on, on, on policies and what the future of Europe should be like. But I'll finish here and uh, I'll give the word to Karl Magnus We'll continue with with uh, with his input. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I will now consider uh, briefly what uh, lessons uh, can be learned from uh, past experiences, and this one, when it comes to uh, the role of uh, Euro parties, political uh, uh, groups in the European Parliament, and the political families, broadly speaking. Uh, and for, for the future, because we have now, and in our report, I think we are um, quite substantially also reviewing, overviewing, reviewing uh, existing research in the field. So I think in that sense also we can, we can really contribute something, I think like a state of the art uh, kind of presentation of what we do know and so on. And uh, obviously what we are looking at here is of course the, uh, very much the potential for influence, right? And we can say that under, as we do in our report, that under the right circumstances, these uh, actors, political actors, so to say, will be able to have an, an, an influ influence and impact on the outcomes of such uh, events, conferences like the present one, and over time on uh, 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 different rounds of treaty reform and so on. But there are conditions involved and we, we discussed these also in the report and I will just briefly um, uh, mention these conditions which point to say some important limits to uh, the, the trend of party political party politicization <laughs> in the EU. And these conditions, of course, simply speaking numerically, the, the extent to which you have a partisan composition in the main institution of the EU, of course, that is highly relevant. And that is also a factor which explains why the EPP and uh, at certain points also the PES in particular have been able to shape the outcomes of treaty reforms substan substantially. And that applies especially to the European Council, that is the head institution, supreme body of decision-making of heads uh, of state and governments, but of course also to commission and parliament, as Tapio uh, mentioned. But as we know from research, including that of my own, this numerical factor or condition is not enough. Beyond that, you need to mobilize these networks and uh, channels of influence, so to say. And I think here there is an interesting variation among these. We have picked here the three main, uh, the biggest, uh, largest uh, Euro parties and their groups. Of course, they are more relevant in this sense. That doesn't mean that the other ones are not or are irrelevant. Of course, potentially they may also be through certain personalities or, or tools or whatever. But here we say, of course, that the mobilization of networks and channels of influence is an important condition beyond the, the partisan composition numerically of the EU institutions. And here you will find, as we also mentioned in the report, the significant um, experience, not least, of these main uh, uh, parties. I would stress the experiences of the European People's Party, which very much acted in sync with its group over the years and in successive treaty reforms. So, of course, this is not just about, <laughs> about mobilizes, mobilizing networks occasionally, it's about continuity. And here they have shown themselves very able in demonstrating that they can mobilize the networks in terms of also the important resources they have. And here it's important to stress, Tapio mentioned the division of labor between Europe parties and political groups. And here it's very important to mention that 
And the research shows that the political groups in the European Parliament have a very important advantage in terms of resources, infrastructure, human resources, personnel, staff. And that is fascinating also when we've been doing this research. You know, you are very often referred to staff and you look, they have like four or five assistants or something like that. I guess if you are a member of national, most national parliaments, you might be en envy of this. But this means, of course, that they, you know, they can provide this kind of continuity in networking. It's very significant, I think. But we should not underestimate the role of the European uh, Europe parties in this. But again, there is a variation uh, among them. The EPP, PP group, again, very much works in sync. I think uh, PS and SND also do that to a large extent. But importantly, and that is an interesting insight, I think, for the future, and we can discuss this later, that is, of course, um, what will happen now if this goes on. This is, of course, a bit speculative, but I think based on existing research, previous findings and our findings, I think it is, I would say it's more likely than not that this will go on to a treaty reform process. And that would mean that you will, at some time, establish a constitutional convention similar to the one we had 2002-2003. We also discussed that experience in the report, where these political families were hugely important, especially at the final stages, when they reached agreement also, of course, across these political families. And that made them altogether much more influential when they were united on uh, important issues. So that will be very interesting um, to see, to follow, because I would expect we this will go to a constitutional convention and then to an uh, intergovernmental conference. And then I think these Euro parties, as we say in the report, will be more mobilized, will play a greater role than they turned out to do here. They were not highly significant. Of course, this is a very difficult um, say, experience of the con conference to say something more general because of all these um, factors which played a role with the COVID, COVID pandemic and uh, especially, right? So there was, of course, a limit to what they were able to do in terms of mobilizing uh, these networks. There we go. <laughs> yeah, of course, there were serious constraints in that respect. Uh, and it might have also affected the balance of power within this, uh, not just the institutional balance of power, but also the power balance <laughs> among actors within political groups. We see quite a limited number of people who are highly significant <laughs> in this, these processes. Okay, so that is just, just to point out that, um, that uh, of course, we discuss actual influence, also potential influence, but also limits to influence of this party politicization trend in the EU, and also to stress the variation. I think even among these three political families, you will see great variation <laughs> when it comes to uh, influence across time, across issues, and across the Euro parties themselves. So. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karl Magnus, and thanks a lot, Tapio, for great presentations. Uh, this was uh, highly thought-provoking, and we don't often say that while meaning it at the same time. <laughs> it's uh, it's research uh, that that has actually, well, at least for myself, it has brought a lot of new questions about democratic uh, democracy on the European level, about national parties, about European parties, and about uh, European citizens. And uh, I will leave that to later, because now I want to hear more from Jessica. Thank you very much, Jakob, and thank you, Tapio and Karl Magnus, uh, for your report. Uh, as as Jakob said, I'm a member of the National Party, the Swedish Riksdag, and, but I'm also a member of the Conference of the, of the Future of Europe, Together with, we are from the Swedish uh, Riksdag, four members, um, two, more for, two from the Moderate Party and two from the S uh, Social Democrats Party. Uh, so that's why I just want to start with giving a, a short reflection of my view on the conference developing, or, or what should I say, because from the beginning I thought that the idea of, idea of 
strengthening citizens' engagements with the EU uh, and in the EU should be is a very important and very um, good thing to do. Um, uh, and uh, because some often I I I've worked as uh, Jakob said in the Committee of European Affairs, and some I feel some very often that people think that Stockholm is very far from people, but Brussels is even farther. Mm-hmm. Um, but we from Sweden and from the moderate party, well, we have been uh, unanimous here in Sweden in the, in the parliament. We have put forward to the to the conference and to the commission and to the uh, to others that we cannot have unreasonable expectation of this conference because that tends that will probably lead to, to disappointments. And my fear and, uh, is that, and I've said this to to a lot of people when I've been re- visiting. Um, for example, Kosak or, or Strasbourg, uh, I, I, I fear and I risk that this project will be a failure. So I'm just saying that, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I'm, I'm trying to, to see the good, all the good things. Because as Tapio said, a lot of uh, citizens have engaged and put forward a very lot of good uh, suggestions. But it, uh, anyway, on that happy note, I will try to, to reflect on your report. Uh, but I will start to say that when I read the report, I, f- I, I, I recognize a lot because I, I, f- I, felt, I have felt some frustration during this year that uh, it's been shared a lot from the European Parliament's parties. Uh, and that and I reflect something and have some self-criticism for also for me from representing the national parties, maybe. Uh, but I... Uh, but so it's it's we've been like not hijacked maybe but um, as you put forward in in the report they have they have sh- they have decided uh, the agenda a little bit and uh, we will see what that will and uh, at the at the moment we have a huge discussion actually about how to take care of all these suggestions but anyway uh, let me start with saying that I'm as a very good and great friend of EU. Uh, uh, as I said, I think I, I engaged the, the thought of having a conference on the future and engaged uh, citizens. Uh, but I think it was wrong, and I said that earlier, uh, and I still think, and I, more I think that now, that it is wrong to have the I think somewhere in the report you said that you described it, that the European parties had uh, use the words democracy, citizens, and transparency for the agenda setting. Uh, and that is good, of course, but I think that's more academic. I, th- I think that if we, ne- if we really want people to engage in the European Union and be more engaged in, our, in the questions, we need to focus on the, uh, the to solving people's problems and, and discussing issues uh, that really uh, engage, like uh, migration uh, and rule of law and uh, and for now examples that EU has actually uh, come together and unanimously p- uh, put forward sanctions for Russia. I think that would really give legacy, uh, leg- legitimacy for the EU, not discussion this more um, transparency and so forth. Uh, so that is one one of the issues that I uh, I think uh, where we went wrong, or it, that's my opinion. Um, the other thing where some you were uh, into that the uh, Tapio said frustration uh, when you talked about um, from the the secretary uh, secretary uh, well, anyway, uh, because COVID came uh, when we were starting to have this um, the seminars and. Uh, uh, working groups, and of course, that really my first plenary was in uh, well, all of us were were in, in digital form, and that of course is not very good for these type of discussions. It was more or less just a monologue. Everybody and mostly politicians put forward their uh, their things, and I, for my sake, uh, from the Swedish thing, we put forward uh, what the priorities should be in our, in our point of view, and that was not a discussion. It was just putting forward. Um, another uh, explanation that you uh, uh, take up in the, in the report and Kalman Magnus put forward here was 
that EP, the European Parliament has a lot of resources. And yes, we are envy. We the, the works in the national parties, uh, parliaments. Uh, we have support in the, in the national parties from from the from the Riksdag, but it's not uh, at all at the same level level as in the European Parliament. And they also, as you said, work more uh, firm and, and with a long term view uh, that we I must admit we don't have. And and then another thing is I'm representing the national party, but also in the Conference of Future of Europe, uh, there were also. Um, regions that will be uh, are involved and they mm. nor have this huge uh, resources I think I have been there and another just a detail for why uh, maybe an explanation uh, why it's um, it's been that very heavily on the European Parliament uh, Europe parties is that the meetings is are in Strasbourg I love Strasbourg, uh, but uh, it's very um, far from Stockholm, and it's very hard to get there. And the, the plenaries has been always next uh, close, uh, close close on to to the when the European Parliament has sessions, which is uh, well, it's just a little bit complaining from my side. Uh, uh, the self criticism is probably maybe that the the national parties, like uh, I, I will come to that later, the media. Uh, we tend to focus on national issues um, and we should focus. I'm biased maybe, but I think that all members of the national party should involve more in the European issues because it, um, it's, um, it's all, all, all together. Um, uh, another thing that I totally agree with uh, on the report is the, that um, I think Top, Tapio talked most about it was how that how little people actually know about the conference. Uh, and you, you didn't want to sh blame the media. Uh, I don't, neither, of course. And there are explanations about the, the pand pandemic and Ukraine. Uh, but uh, to put it in even broader <laughs> context, I feel uh, that the media uh, is not uh, neither interesting in, in, you talked about that, that the media doesn't, Follow and uh, closely the, for example, the European parties. Uh, for example, I'm I'm a member of the EPP group. Of my parties, uh, our uh, congresses, but they neither talk so much about the EU um, matters uh, at a whole in Sweden. We had this yearly come, upcoming debate in the parliament in the chamber here. It should be the party leaders, but due to some for COVID reasons, it's been changed that so the Hans Dagen, our uh, Minister of the EU Affairs, and uh, the spokespersons of the EU Affairs had this debate. It's a very huge debate, but it was very little writ written written about that in the media. So it's not just the EU European Parliament politics policies that's written a little about. So I agree, but but the media plays an important role. They should play an important role. And um, uh, I, and also uh, think that public service should take more responsibility to know more and how the system works because I I sometimes think that I need to to explain how, how these different uh, institutions really work. So that's an engagement that uh, uh, I have to also take, uh, but also the media itself. Uh, just uh, some final. Uh, was I have so many notes here because uh, um, uh, just about this um, um, treaty changes. Um, as I mentioned, I am uh, well, moderate parties member of the U uh, EPP group, uh, but we have, um, um, and that this is a Swedish um, consensus issue that we don't we have from the beginning, so that uh, we don't see the need for treaty changes. Uh, and uh, that's a continuous, <laughs> continually discussion within the EPP um, group, I should say. Uh, but uh, and I, that's also a very important about how to handle and realization realize this outcome from the conference uh, is quite hard for you know, on a constitutional way for a Swedish parliamentarian because we cannot. We I don't have the mandate to actually. 
do something about the, the outcome on the conference on the 9th of May. Uh, and that some of my colleagues do, around Europe uh, don't have the same problem. Anyway, uh, as uh, Karl Manus mentioned, he thought that it will be a, a, con a I don't remember, the, the constitutional uh, conference somewhere. And I just want to, to put out that uh, during the spring 2023, uh, the Sweden Sweden is the presidency of the EU. Uh, so this is, uh, oh, uh, no matter what I think, <laughs> uh, I think this is something that we in, this, in Sweden need to be prepared to handle. Uh, whether we want or not, because I think you have a, a, it's a point there. Even though uh, treaty changes has been discussed from the European Parliament party mostly uh, for a very long time. Uh, so to summarize, uh, uh, I'm just thinking that is something more that I need to comment on. Uh, summarize. Um, so from the beginning, I thought this was a very good idea with the few, with the conference. Uh, I'm a little bit worried about how the outcome will be, and I'm also um, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that it will be a failure, and that is not what we want. Um, but uh, we, I think, this report uh, gave me some uh, um, strength. In, uh, it it it, oh, it it says what I really thought in, but I didn't have it on paper or to put it somewhere that way. But thank you very good for a good report. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jessica. If um, if you don't mind, I would like to uh, abuse my right as chair to throw out the first question, and I I guess I will throw this out for all of you to grab from whichever end you want to. Uh, I want to. Um, uh, continue with something that Jessica said. Well, you all said it, I think. We're managing expectations, but this it will uh, feed into other areas as well. There, there are some some different elements that that uh, that is inherent to this uh, conference. One thing is the uh, what what was outlined in uh, from the Lions po political guidelines, which was. Uh, um, an issue of democracy and involving the citizenry in the conversation about the future of Europe to answer as an answer to the democratic deficit, not as one answer, but the, not as the answer, but one answer. We try to try to manage these things, you know, and we also saw a, a stronger, stronger voting record for in the, uh, the parliamentary elections last time around. So this will be some sort of answer. Now we need, uh, now we need to, uh, to have a bigger conversation about this and we need to involve the citizens for the good of European democracy. But also on the other end, we see some very strong ambitions from, from, the, uh, from the European Parliament as, you, as we, we see from your report. There is a there is great convergence as always almost a cohesive uh, program regarding treaty change, uh, institutional um, uh, integration and policies. Um, and bearing in mind that this conference has had quite it's had it has it has passed almost uh, unnoticed, whether it has to do with national parties or media or both or the difficulties from the EP groups to reach out to the citizens. Is this a dangerous contradiction? If we're talking about the uh, Constitutional Convention and uh, an intergovernmental, uh, intergovernmental conference, that would possibly lead to treaty change without the foundation of the conference from the beginning, that is the involvement of the citizens. On You see the contradiction, where there is massive reform ambitions, but without the involvement of the citizens. Is this a, are we looking at a 2002-2003 scenario again, maybe? I don't know who wants to start or if this makes sense, but uh, open bar. Uh, Tapio, please. Well, well, I think we have to be, you know, remember that at least this time around, there is an, there is an actual attempt at reaching out to the citizens. I mean, do remember that that uh, you know, if you look at past IGCs, intergovernmental conferences, the only way really in which public opinion has fed into these uh, 
treaty reforms is through national parliamentary elections. And as we do know, in most of those, EU issues are very much in the background. And uh, so it's, you know, it's a fallacy to say that somehow in the past it would have been better. And, and, uh, and fortunately now, through various kinds of challenges that the world and, and Europe is facing, you know, first Euro crisis, uh, Brexit, COVID, what have you, these have all, all elevated the role of the EU in national election campaigns and national politics. And I think this is a good thing because it means that uh, national parties, which often are internally internally sort of uh, not united in, in over Europe, so when there is enough pressure from the public, from the media, then national politicians will always will also have to react and they have to debate uh, European issues. And, and so, so I believe that uh, now if there would be kind of a treaty uh, reform process, whether in the form of a, an actual sort of a constitutional convention or something else, I think it would actually be on a stronger democratic foundation than previously. Uh, but having said that, of course, you know, I, I can sort of understand or sympathize to an extent with these cynical views of this conference on the future of Europe. But then again, you know, the we have to remember the sort of a scale of this. EU brings together 27 countries, half a billion citizens almost, all these different languages, cultures, and national medias. And so I think that if we are being realistic, then the fact that that the conference is organized in the first place and that it has mobilized hundreds of thousands of Europeans. Now, I, I do think that is a that is a fairly good achievement. And uh, but of course, I, and I like to blame national politicians. So I would say that national politicians also deserve deserve to look in the mirror. Why don't national parliaments organize debates about the future of Europe now that the conference is taking place? You know, it would be simple. It has, surely hasn't happened in Finland, and I very much doubt it has happened in, in Sweden either. And, and also then do remember now that when we have these Euro Party documents, you know, like, like I said in my presentation, you know, even if Swedish parties or Finnish parties, what have you, even if they sort of a, are against treaty change, these same parties have have, have uh, you know, agreed to the Euro Party position papers. So there is a discrepancy between what is going on in so-called Brussels and then what is being said in member state capitals. And that's not really honest. Thank you. Thank you, Tapio. Uh, does anybody else want to take a bite out of that? Jessica, please, national parties. Uh, yes. Now we have not had a, a solo discussion in the debate in the chamber about the Conference of Future of Europe, but we have, of course, have a lot of discussion in the Committee on the European Affairs, where we where we give the mandate to the government to to negotiate, and we all have also have a, a lot of discussions when when we yearly discuss the uh, uh, EU. The first questions in the in the chamber anyway and maybe that's a good idea uh, after we see in the after 9th of may what what do i know anyway for it's it's um, being a swede and being a member of a moderate party I, it's uh, i just I, of course I, I realize that we will discuss treaty changes maybe but i strongly believe that this that will not this, the suggestions that have been put forward that you you had on one of the slides uh, is not, on my my point of view, not will will not strengthen democracy, nor it will um, engage more transparency and uh, have the citizens more engaged. Uh, on, from my point of view, it's more important to strengthen the institutions uh, that we already have. And maybe that is easy for me as a Swede to say, is since we have the European the Committee on European Affairs that is very involved with together with the gov our government, no matter what party is leading the government, uh, compared to other countries in the European Union, and also that uh, taking into to account that uh, we have a huge, I don't know the level of how many who votes in the, in the, in the to the European Parliament. 
but we have a, a lot of people, uh, even though it's not that, that high as in national uh, elections. But but uh, so that's why it's hard for me to to discuss the the, the treaty changes. Um, so yes, I, and I understand what you say, Tapi, about the, the the EP. I don't think it's false because from about the treaty changes from the moderate party, we have been very we have uh, put forward a lot of reservations about just the Spitzenkandidat and the the transnational list. And we this is a Swedish. Um, not only the moderate parties from the other parties also in Sweden. So we try to, it's not a secret what we think about that. Thank you, Jessica. Carl Magnus, you want to yeah. come in? I, I can well? just mention when, when you talk about this, I come to think about this uh, term used by some uh, Europeanized uh, scholars, the, the capability expectations gap. I find it so interesting because what we see, we mentioned it briefly, in our report that there is a momentum building up. It's a typical word, you know, you usually look at this, it's moving step by step, and suddenly we have experience from 20, 20 years ago, some governments, parties and so on were opposed to this uh, treaty reform, and suddenly it just happens. But you don't want to talk about it from some nation, national government <clears throat> or party side, because you don't want to reveal, reveal your uh, compromises or your sacrifices or whatever. you don't want to be uh, a loser and that's maybe a problem with media generally <clears throat> that they will always point to winners and losers who wins who loses that's the dynamic and logic but i think what's happening now is that we see in several important areas building up not just momentum but a very strong powerful argument for uh, treaty amendment or reform right in uh, external relations, as we know, of course, health policy, <clears throat> not least. And there will be huge expectations uh, for the EU to, to deliver more, to develop cap capabilities. And in the end, this has to do with uh, legitimacy, right? And we, uh, as political scientists in this field, we are all aware of these debates on <laughs> legitimacy, input legitimacy, output legitimacy. Of course, input, it means more citizen involvement. We heard about this for, for decades. I might be a bit more cynical here about this, but uh, of course, I think it's uh, really, it, I agree, it's very fascinating to see what they've been doing in, in uh, not just in the conference uh, framework itself, but not least the Party European Socialist S&D. They have had some, of course, really participatory engagement in this. But I think there will be a very strong, um, uh, let's say, uh, pressure, you know, for, for political decision makers, policy makers, to really develop EU's capacities in a number of fields, very central areas to uh, welfare of, of people. And now, of course, with the, with the uh, let's say, uh, weak in, weakened uh, uh, economies, of course, there might be added pressures on, on that side. Thanks a lot. It's interesting to hear about this because uh, uh, during the pandemic, there were we, one thing that we talked about a lot, uh, at least here at the office, was um, the quite elevated expectations on the European Union to do something. We were not sure about what it was, but people said that EU is not doing anything. But then everybody said, "Well, they don't. There is no competence on this field." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and it's uh, a par par paradox. So the, yeah, it's a paradox. And what we'll what we're seeing now, after or during the pandemic, and now with uh, with war in the in the, um, in Central Europe, are we seeing less polarization between institutions or between member states on this uh, in this regard? Because when I was reading it uh, from the beginning, I thought about this is multi level uh, multi level polarization between you know on the one hand governments. And on the one, uh, on the other hand, we see the European Parliament and the supranational structures are being more assertive in the in their ambitions on on integration. But then again, we see the pandemic and uh, that it brought the uh, the nation states together in a way. And now with uh, war in Ukraine, uh, a similar tendency maybe. What are your thoughts on this? Are in in terms of the results of the uh, the outcomes of the uh, of the uh, of the conference. Do we see less or, or more polarization? It's difficult to tell, but 
What are you? What are your views on this? And in the short term, short we have seen less. Uh, um, we have seen more unanimous, obviously, as I mentioned. Uh, and I think that is a good thing for the EU as a whole and, of course, as in, for Ukraine. Um, and I, I am hopeful that that will um, actually uh, make EU more um, important, both in a bigger term, in a geopolitical sense, and also for, for me, as I, I started with saying that uh, if we want EU to have more legitimacy, I think EU has to focus on things that really change this people's life to the better, and uh, so and that's my political uh, will in a way. So, so I, I think that we in the well, anyway in the short term, I think uh, this will more make it more uh, unanimous. Magnus, do you want to come in? No, no, I think this is this makes sense. Uh, it's just interesting always in the EU when you look at the political calendars with the presidential elections, uh, national parliamentary elections, European Parliament elections, and you can somehow foresee, right, when you will have a major decision making, when some will be postponed, might there be increased uh, uh, high level of conflicts? Because Obviously, when it comes to this mobilization, it's not good in European Parliament election to campaign and ask voters to vote if you all agree, right? You need to find something <laughs> beyond. You have disagreements, obviously you have. I mean, when it comes to, say, issue of social Europe, uh, extent to which there should be regulation in a number of areas, in economy, whatever. So you will easily find that. But of course, there is a huge challenge now, obviously, to find uh, unity. Right for the EU as a, as a whole, and I guess that's what people would expect. And what will be very interesting to see is also how how popular support will develop for uh, what we usually call the radical right populist parties, because uh, we often tend to to be misled. You know that somehow if uh, you think they could benefit right from too much collusion, right? If you have a centrist uh, move towards the center on the main families, there will be uh, room, of course, for them, right, to capitalize on this. But uh, sometimes you've seen in France, for instance, you will see that you would see also um, electorate really expecting, right, of politicians now to confront the real issues that matter to them. So I think it's, it's a kind of different dynamic, and especially also in terms of... Uh, the political calendar, I think we should recognize that. Political time uh, matters a lot. Uh. You mentioned about, in the report, you mentioned one of the, the, um, the conclusions is that while, while the, the um, Euro parties were quite successful in, uh, in uh, defining interests and ambitions, um, as regards to this, uh, the future of Europe, less uh, efforts were being made to actually reach out to citizens. How is how do we how, how should we understand the conference on the uh, future of Europe when this from from the the directly elected uh, uh, organizations uh, po po political organizations and the main mobilizers of you of uh, public opinion and in a in a conference that is actually was actually initiated in order to have a conversation about Europe and this was one of the uh, I don't want to say failures but I'm saying it this was one of the the where, where there were less efforts being made on this in this regard because we've been talking a lot about the national parties and the role of national parties in uh, in their in the in the conversation about European affairs what does, does this say anything about the uh, abilities of Europe, Euro parties and the EP groups? Well, I, I could perhaps start. I mean, I think it is important not to exaggerate the mobilization potential of political parties in, in, you know, in, in today's Europe. Uh, 
parties, political parties do have members, of course, uh, less so than before. But most of these members are fairly old, especially when we look at social democrats, for example. And, and uh, so when we talk in, in the report about, about the Euro parties perhaps not doing enough in terms of reaching out to their activists, you have to remember that there isn't much of a, I mean, there are activists, but I mean, but I mean, it's a very limited number of individuals throughout Europe who are involved in this. So the way it really could have happened more extensively is through national parties, national politicians that would have reached out to their, you know, their supporters. And of course, within the context of this report, we simply don't have any kind of debate data about this. You know, so I'm, I'm absolutely certain that in Sweden, some individual members of Riksdag or members of the European Parliament did exactly this, that they were, you know, engaging with their, with their supporters. Uh, about the conference, uh, so so I wouldn't blame blame the blame the Euro parties too much. I mean, it, I think that's a bit unfair on them. But but at the same time, I do believe that you know what we see now in the in Europe today is that there is already a rich uh, European sort of a public sphere, if you like, in terms of civil society organizations, for example. You know, environmental groups would be a, would be the, perhaps the best illustration. You know, that bring together citizens across the European Union. You know, and, and thousands of these people join together mainly online, sometimes also physically. And so, I think here the Euro parties in the future could do a lot more. You know, and and also because one of the good things about coming out of this COVID crisis is that we realize now how much we can simply do online. You know, not just via social media, but arranging all kinds of hybrid or online meetings, and and uh, you know, and I think it is this is where the Euro, European level parties should collaborate more with the national member parties in in reaching out to these citizens. But we also know from previous research that national member parties have often been against giving individual members of the Euro parties, that is, normal citizens a stronger role inside the Euro parties. So national parties have often sort of been afraid how the Euro parties might reach out directly, you know, to the citizens. And that, that's a strange, you know, strange situation. And, and, uh, and I, hoped, I hope that would change, you know, because after all, we are not just Swedes or Finns, we are EU citizens. And, uh, and hence, you know, we can we should be able to engage more directly with European level politics, and indeed, indeed, a lot of people are doing it. You know, regardless of whether they are party members or not. Thank you, Thank you. Jessica. Is this is it a unbecoming task to be a to be a um, a Swede in Europe in that sense? Because I mean, obviously, the uh, let me explain what I mean about that. Um, Obviously, the I mean, make, doing politics in the European Union is about uh, compromise and pragmatism. There are no absolutes in a way, but politics is usually about absolutes and drawing red lines, and more so today with the polarized um, political landscape. And Sweden, who is um, a sort of a conservative member of the European Union, should we say, that tries to contain further integration on in many areas, not on the areas where, where we are interested in European cooperation, where we want to fully integrate a lot. But is this, does this make it more difficult from uh, the grassroots le level or the national level to talk about these issues? Because eventually you can't be make any, draw any red lines or say exactly what you want, because ultimately you're going to go to Brussels and compromise. And you can't, you, you, you risk coming home uh with uh, with a compromised face mm. i can start like this um, i think it's in for um, to, i talk a lot about uh, eu uh, with citizens in in sweden uh, of course since this is my questions and i should say that is uh, i'm for example i'm often out and talk about for for my in my party uh, and I think uh, my slides, my PowerPoints will change uh, um, before 24th of February and after, because I should say that a lot of 
from my voters uh, have been quite skeptical, not even conservative, but quite skeptical how they see that EU has developed. Uh, with the recovery fund, for one example, a quite huge uh, example. But anyway, uh, so I, my when I speak, spoken to people, it's more like defending the European Union. Uh, and that's not where I want to be because my party and I, myself is very pro EU. Uh, but uh, that's the, the sense uh, when I speak to people. Uh, after 24th of uh, February, uh, I think we have. We have another view on EU. Uh, we just seen the beginning of that, that as, as mentioned on your first, on your last question, because we see that the twenty seventh country, no, the twenty seven country, can work together when it comes to very important questions. Uh, so I think that, of course, it's it's very frustrating to come home and say uh, we have compromised on this. Uh, uh, matter and you can take another example where where we have in Sweden a huge debate at the, at the moment about the um, fuel prices and one of the explanations why it is so very high is because of the um, I don't know the word in English energy um, taxation um, directive maybe a very su- Swedish uh, <laughs> direct uh, translation uh, so and that is very easy for people just to blame the Brussels uh, so of course it's, it's, it still will be a problem, but on the whole, I think that the when this this in this crisis we can have a new debate on what EU is really good at. I think we missed we, we should talk more about the EU when it comes to the pandemic, for example, when we saw the the vaccination roll up. That was really a big, a very successful thing about what EU did uh, with the, the rollout of the vaccination. And I, I, sh- I would like that the media and myself, of course, also talk about more than like the success stories, and uh, not only the failures. But uh, I can put a lot of questions when when Swedes uh, think that EU is uh, in a lot of in our discussion things that they don't think the EU should discuss, and that makes it hard sometimes. I don't know if that was the question, on your, the answer on your question. No, uh, I'm um, not really. But, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, but I'm sure it's uh, that that well, it's more of an a no-brainer in a way. But uh, if I could uh, draw the attention to the conference again, what are the are, what are the next dates? Are there anything we know for sure? What is coming up with the conference in uh, in the near future? Because we're talking about late spring. Uh, if I can start, we have the plenary session uh, next weekend, eighth uh, and ninth of April, and then another one in twenty ninth and thirty of April, and then it will be, and that's uh, uh, and in between, of course, working groups, and then it will be this. Um, I don't know. It was Tapio who talked about this high, high, old Karl Magnus high level uh, event on the 9th of May. And with that, if there is nothing else that uh, Karl Magnus or Tapio would like to add to the discussion or the reflections, I would like to turn everybody's attention to CF's website where you can download and read this full report and along with uh, all other publications of ours and, and our podcasts. And I would like to thank all of you, Karl Magnus Juvalso and Tapio Raunio, for the great report that you've written for us, and Jessica Roosevelt for taking the time to come and speak to us about this and broadening and deepening the discussion. My name is Jakob Levander from CIPS, and a very warm thank you to all of you.